In the last quarter of 2016, over 1,300 stone throwing incidents were recorded in the West Bank, and the rate is increasing in the first days of 2017. During that same period, the Army recorded over 200 Molotov cocktails being thrown at IDF soldiers and civilians, with another 26 so far this month. Attending an IDF briefing in Beit El yesterday, Netanyahu acknowledged that Israel is being negatively impacted by the regional developments. He did note, however, the significant efforts and breakthroughs the Army has made that he says are going in the right direction. Security expert Dr. Martin Sherman joins us now in the studio to expand upon the issue. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So my first question for you is, what are some of the new IDF efforts and breakthroughs that Netanyahu is referring to? Well, I must confess that I don't have any inside information as to the operational details of how the IDF is going to conduct itself in the future. But I, th I think the question is far more conceptual than operational. I think, you know, if you, if you look back at how the conflict has developed, the Palestinians keep finding new ways to confront and to challenge the army. I don't think when, uh, in 2005, when we uh, evacuated Gaza unilaterally, anyone imagined the kind of challenges we'd be facing in Gaza today, with missiles capable of hitting virtually all uh, civilian centers here, with uh, a myriad of attack centers. And if everyone had known that, that was going to be the reality, I'm very doubtful as to whether we would have pulled out of Gaza. So I think, when I say it's conceptual, we need to know what our end, end state strategic goals are. Because unless you can do that, unless you know that, you can't formulate effective policy. If we're still stuck in the mode of two-state solutions, then the Israeli government and the Israeli IDF cannot adopt policies sufficiently robust to confront the challenges of uh, the Palestinian terror. Because if you do that, you will basically eliminate the chances of future negotiations. So un until the Israeli government decides on its long-term future strategy and then can uh, derive its policy from there, I think we're going to be uh, locked into an ongoing cat and mouse uh, um, combat between uh, us and the Palestinians, where the Palestinians will come up with a new idea, we'll find a solution, then they'll come up with something else, we'll find a solution. They came up with suicide bombers, so we had the barrier. Now they have the individuals, and so we're trying to find a solution to that. I, I really don't think that any localized operational solution is what we're looking for at the moment. So what would we be looking for? Well, I think the, f the first thing that we have to do is extinguish all Palestinian hopes that their struggle will succeed. Because I really believe that the Palestinian violence is driven by hopes that eventually that the Jews will give up. And today, the major challenge facing Israel today, apart from the Iranian issue, is not a large-scale invasion by Arab armies, but ongoing attrition. Uh, if you look back and see what happened in the last engagement in Gaza, where um, Jewish communities were abandoned, which is something reasonably new. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what will happen if there's another protracted conflict in Gaza and uh, the communities in the Gaza area are, again, subject to shelling, whether there won't be large-scale and permanent uh, evacuation. Uh, and if that happens on our eastern front with Judea and Samaria, um, and you cannot maintain ongoing socio-economic routine within your urban areas, I think that would, could develop into a great threat uh, for the stability of the country long term. So I think what you have to do is develop a policy which conveys the message to the Palestinians that they will never succeed. And, but that, as I said before, is conceptualizing before you operationalize. But, you know, that, that brings about a, a few, a, a number of different questions. You know, like, for example, number one, you, you brought up how we didn't imagine that we would have the shellings and, and the attacks that we currently have from Gaza. But Hamas and, and other, you know, armed factions in Gaza had no problem t saying very publicly that they would continue shelling long after we, we left the West Bank in 2005, or in Gaza in 2005. Yes, but when we left Gaza in 2005, the most formidable high-trajectory weapon 
was something that could deliver a five kilometer uh, charge over five, over five, sorry, five kilome kilogram charge over five kilometers. Whereas today, they can deliver a 100, 100 uh, kilogram charge over 100 kilometers. Uh, no one ever thought of the, the, the question of tunnels. So whenever you abandon territory, the question is, what are they going to do in that territory? And every single time that we have abandoned territory, the Palestinians or the Arabs have converted into a platform to attack us, whether it was almost immediately in Gaza, whether it took a few months in Judea and Samaria, whether it took a few years in South Lebanon, or in a few decades into Sinai, which I think is going to be a horrendous security problem. So what what should be done, you know, because we have, if Netanyahu is going out and alleging all these breakthroughs in security, and then at the same time we have the IDF coming out with statistics about how in the last quarter of, of the year alone that, you know, attacks have gone up, isn't there a disconnect? There's, there's Well, I, th I think there is, and I think, I think the disconnect is the fact is that we are not approaching the Palestinian issue in a strategic manner. We're trying to deal with problems ad hoc as they arise. So we have suicide bombers and we deal with that. And then we have uh, the, the individual attacks, so we try and find a solution for that. Uh, and we, we had the, the rockets, so we had the Iron Dome. So e each time the Palestinians come up with a new threat, which we have to find a solution to. But unless you can basically remove the, the hope of Palestinians, to overcome the Jewish nation state, we're going to carry on with this with this cat and mouse uh, game uh, for decades. And I said, and the, and the threat is the ongoing attrition. And if, if the Palestinians ha uh, can maintain this ongoing attrition over time, I, I think there's serious doubts about the long-term stability of the country, especially if there's going to be pressure for for, for territorial withdrawals close to our urban areas in Judea and Samaria. So we, you know. So kind of have like a like a, a battle, you know. We have we have to destroy any hopes uh, so that the attrition will stop. But at the same time, a lot of people are, are saying that the attrition is continuing because the Palestinians feel hopeless. Well, I, I think the facts prove exactly the opposite. Uh, if you want a, a microcosm of that, look what happened in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Israel removed every vestige of Jewish presence there, including the graveyards, apart from the synagogues which were promptly destroyed. The Palestinians, if they wanted to, could have built a thriving community there. Instead of destroying the high-tech uh, greenhouses, uh, they could have used them to generate jobs, generate produce, generate higher living. They, they, they didn't do it. Because we have to understand that the real aspiration behind the Palestinian violence is not uh, their desire for self-determination, but their desire to eliminate Jewish self-determination. They do not really want to establish a state. They want to demolish a state. And unless we confront that, we will never be able to find a long-term solution to the Palestinian terror. All right, well, I hope we can figure out the solution uh, and, and, you know, be done with, with the wars and all the terror. Uh, as, as quickly as possible. So. Well, perhaps you can invite me back and we can discuss the solution. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.